Okay, we were uh, in our last class last week. <clears throat> we were going over <clears throat> um, Exodus 12 and 13, and we discovered that within just those two chapters, um, there are three major clumps. It'd be nice to say paragraphs, but they're not because they just roll down the way the scriptures do, just keep on going and they don't move into paragraphs. Three main clumps that are very similar and could easily have been read as the exact same thing if you didn't pay close attention. And what I found <coughs> is the closer attention I paid to it, the more differences that I found <coughs> and important differences. And so um, the last time we got together on this, I covered uh, the first two, which was the first one had to do with the lamb, the Passover, <clears throat> the emphasis being on eating the lamb, obviously killing the lamb and eating the lamb, uh, and then, you know, putting the blood up, but the Passover after that, much of the time did not include the blood it was primarily focused on eating the lamb. And, um, and then we moved to uh, unleavened bread and the place of unleavened bread. And we saw, we saw the lamb part was in chapter 12. And then we moved to unleavened bread, which was in chapter 13. And there were only a few verses in front of it. And then it immediately went into that parallel thing, that, that sort of a form or, or style that, that the, the writer used in chapter 12 when presenting the Passover and the lamb. And then <coughs> um, uh, we ended before we got into the next one, which was just, let me even look, see real quick. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's no break. So it immediately goes into the firstborn and the emphasis on the firstborn. And so what we discovered from that is that while all of that in the beginning of chapter 12 mentions all of it, kind of mixes it all in there, then it get, once it gets past that, you start seeing the individual emphasis of each one. <coughs> and... Uh, so that's what this chart on the board is, and I, I don't claim that it's complete because when I said to you I would put the chart on the board for you last week, um, I didn't have a lot of time to really dig anymore. So, you know, that's always a good thing for you if you decide to do so. Um, <clears throat> so now we want to talk about the firstborn, and uh, we want to... Go, we want to do that from Exodus 13 again. And last time we left off at verse 10. Now we're going to start at verse 11 through 16. <coughs> and <coughs> I'm going to read it, and I want you to just see if it doesn't seem to follow that same sort of pattern. Uh, beginning verse 11. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites. Okay. Uh, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee. <clears throat> okay, so the others always mention this too. Everything happens in the land. Ultimately, that's where the promises are. Uh, hence, the land of promise. <clears throat> um, and then, then verse 12, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast the male shall be the Lord's and every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb and if thou wilt not redeem it then thou shalt break its neck and all and all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem and it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come saying what is this that thou shalt say unto him, Thy strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. 
And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it <clears throat> shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes, for by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. Okay, so the, those verses are talking about the firstborn. And it is clear when you compare them that each section or, or grouping uh, is clearly that. The Passover, unleavened bread, and now the firstborn. And yet the pattern is so similar, but it is not similar. It's just, it's almost like the, the well, I don't know if I could describe it correctly because the information is different. <clears throat> so, um, so I just wrote down here, um, when you tell people that two groups came out of Egypt, Israel and the firstborn, it means little to them because they are unaware of how pervasive the subject of the firstborn is. So here's why I wrote that. And here's what I want to ask you. Have you, in all of your Christian life and searching of the scriptures, noticed this section that primarily was dealing with the firstborn? And it's not just this section. It really is a huge portion of Exodus. Did you see that that was a separate group that came out of Egypt and that God speaks not just here, but throughout the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, throughout the Bible, though, uh, regularly dividing Israel from those that he counts as the firstborn, whether he uses the word firstborn or not, and many times he does. And that he sees a difference between those who he redeemed, he literally, the lamb literally died for them to live that they might be sacrificed. And it's just a flat out fact. It's just undeniable. And it bears itself out again in all these different places. And remember, uh, maybe, maybe hopefully we'll finish up tonight uh, on uh, Exodus and we'll be able to move to Cain and Abel. <clears throat> and then we'll move on to um, Ishmael and Isaac, and then we'll move on to Jacob and Esau, and then we'll move on to Joseph and his brethren, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see the exact same thing happen over and over because, listen carefully, because Israel doesn't live as a firstborn because they just live as redeemed, and their mindset is to be delivered from what? Uh, the house of bondage, whatever it is up here, I can't remember where it is. Um, <clears throat> the big deliverance for them was the house of bondage, and that's what they talk about. Well, I was a sinner, I was in the house of bondage. But firstborns talk about, I was redeemed that I might do the same thing that that firstborn lamb did to redeem me that I may be given in the same manner and in the same spirit as a firstborn or as a lamb or as a firstborn lamb, if you will. <clears throat> Bless you. I'm glad you do it loud enough where people don't just think I'm blessing people as I'm preaching. You know? <clears throat> um, so uh, <clears throat> some things of note here is verse 11 when brought into the land. And the others mention this too. Uh, verse 12 and 13, the particular emphasis of the whole section, again, giving God his firstborn. So I didn't have a lot of room here. I probably could have written that there. But it's really not about the firstborn. It's giving the father 
his firstborn son, which was the very thing that he said from the beginning, not in chapter 12 or 13, but in chapter 4, before Moses even left the wilderness, he was just starting the journey, and God spoke to him and said, let my son, my firstborn son go. Because that was what was on his heart. <clears throat> but what was also on his heart, and you have to know this, was to deliver Israel from bondage because he hears our cries. Okay? Israel, I'm talking about Israel, not the firstborn. He also wanted to deliver them from bondage. And he does that, and he does it freely. Um, but it's a, it's a different relationship. It's a different relationship. And that's why the first book of the Bible, Genesis, beginnings, the whole book basically is about this division between what is the firstborn and what's just going to be Israel, the people. <clears throat> All right. So uh, verses 14 through 15, when thy son asks, and uh, by strength of hand, he brought us out. And most of those also include that. So uh, those aren't on the board either. But there, there are the, these common things. And so let's see. Um, and then verse 16, a token on your hand, frontlets on your eyes, by strength of hand you were brought out. That token and frontlets, that thing that affects your hands and your eyes, your doing and your, your mindset um, is not mentioned in the other two. That is strictly for the firstborn. Strictly for the firstborn. So, um, I'll just read this. Everything said thus far in Exodus 13, 11 through 16 has to do with, with God uh, getting his firstborn son. So the question is directed toward that, meaning when thy son asks. The answer to the firstborn son asking what this means is that it is about the firstborn and that God wanted that and not just a delivered Israel. <clears throat> All right, so... Uh, would, uh, the question may arise, would God have delivered Israel if there was nothing to do with the firstborn? Uh, yes and no. No, he wouldn't have because you have to have the firstborn. It's the firstborn lamb. It was Jesus' death as a lamb that brought him out. And so there is that, there is that. But on the other hand, no, he'll, he'll deliver people. He'll deliver people without having anything to do with the firstborn, except for behind it all was an innocent person who took everything, everything, every, not just every sin, every uh, thought process, every motive, you know, he died, he died for that, and he brought him out. So, um, verse 15, Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord every male that first opens the womb. So there is that. He, he said, let my firstborn son go. Okay, so now let's take it out of the context of thousands of years ago. And let's put it in the context of why this is important now. It's important now because if we, if we understand correctly and we sense what God is saying here and we feel drawn to that, then something of the firstborn that is in us, because they all ate the lamb, the firstborn. You see that? They all ate what died for them or what was self-giving. They all put it on the inside of them. But it appears that really only the firstborn recognize or somehow realize what's in them. And they are supposed to go and be given in like manner. Okay? 
Um, I've never liked dividing stuff up like this, but to me, this is, it's there. So I'm not gonna, you know, because then somebody will say they're superior or something like that, or th this or that, you know. In God's eyes, it has nothing to do with superior or better or well, you know, you're not as good or da da da. It has to do with is His firstborn in you, and is He ready to live in this manner? Then you're a firstborn. And if you're not, then you're just Israel, and thank God you got delivered from bondage. And, I, and again, as I've said before, I'm sure you are saved because that's the, really the nature of Israel was saved from, you were saved from bondage, you were saved from hell, you were saved from punishment, meaning I'm sure that, you, you know, uh, you'll spend eternity with the Lord. I do wonder how soon as, you know, like in Revelation when John's caught up and everybody's worshiping the slaughtered lamb and the words that they say are not, you should really look close at them. They are not saying, they're not worshiping the lamb saying who, who saved us and delivered us and all this kind of stuff. They're saying who redeemed us and through his death and died. And they're giving glory to the slaughtered lamb not the raised lamb. Now, now, if you get a chance, look at it closely because um, that's what it's saying. And so I'm going, okay, well, I don't know. I, I don't know. So I'm not going to say. I can speculate on a few things, but I'm not going to speculate. All right. Um, Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord. The, the word therefore is saying that because I spared your firstborn who should have died, therefore he belongs to me in death by a sacrificial death. You see that? I'm reading verse 15. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord every male that first opens the womb. Uh, and so again, I said the word therefore is saying because I spared your firstborn who should have died, therefore he belongs to me in death by a sacrificial death. All right, well, <clears throat> um, then God provided this redemption thing. All right, so Deb and I were talking about this, and um, she shared something with me that was so deeply profound to me and struck me and will never leave me. I was just reiterating some on the um, the second stage where God, you know, the firstborn, the firstborns weren't going to be given. Either they weren't going to be given or their parents wouldn't give them. <clears throat> uh, and that is an issue in the Bible. It's an issue in the Bible. It's an issue in this whole context here. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and so I was just sharing with her how, what a great gap it was to, for, the, for the father to literally get his firstborn son out of the firstborns, you understand? To get that lamb that was slain lived out of them. And what a great gap that was to go to, to animal sacrifices. And she said, well, you look at Adam and Eve and God covered them with skins and stuff. And they, I'm sure they came out of there going, you know, thank God for these skins and thank God we've been redeemed from, we should have died when the day that we eat and thank God we've been redeemed and thank God that there was a sacrifice for us. And the father is looking, and this is what she said, and he's looking and going, you should be full of the tree of life. That's what I wanted out of you, the tree of life, filled with the tree of life. And instead, you're filled with the knowledge of good and evil, and these skins are the result of death that's covered you. What you down? That's a gap. 
that's a huge gap. And you just go, I mean, I just, I, I thank God I was sitting down, we were in a car, I think I would have buckled to my knees because we, we, we read that story and we read the Exodus, and we read the New Testament scriptures that say he died for us. And the main thing we get out of it is skins that cover us and the deliverance out of bondage and the this and that. And this is what we preach from church to church to church. And we never ever get to the point where we say, well, you know, uh, these animal sacrifice, I mean, Hebrews does and says, you know, I'm sick of your sacrifices. You know, we think, well, because they're doing them wrong or they're not doing it sincere. It's just not the firstborn. I wanted from the very beginning, and they represented by this tree that was the cross. It's the tree of life. It's where life comes from. And we reject that. I, I'm a firstborn, and the heck with it. If he's going to make a provision where I can wear skins and get out of it, then I'll do it. And you know what? That doesn't bother a whole lot of people. It doesn't bother them. Even if they heard this, they would go, well, you know, praise God, at least I'm saved or something. But I will tell you, it deeply affects me. It deeply, deeply, to my core, makes me go, my Lord. I mean, I put myself in the position of Adam and, and, and I'm going out of the garden, being cast out of the garden so that I can't get to the tree of life because I'm too enthralled with I'm redeemed and, you know, and the, the main thing I'm gonna miss about that is that, you know, there was a, a mist that came down and watered the garden every day and there, there was, a, it was beautiful and there were animals there, there were this and that and everything was peaceful and I'm gonna miss that. And the father says, no, I'll tell you what you missed. You missed the greatest thing that could have happened to you. You missed the tree of life, you know. And then, you know, you go all the way back to the end, book of Revelation. There it is, tree of life. What's feeding it? What is feeding the tree of life? The last slain lamb on the throne flowing out from that slain lamb is feeding the tree of life. And we get over there by the river of life and we miss the tree of life and we, we notice, oh, 12 different kinds of fruits or whatever, you know. Oh, well, that's really cool. I can't wait to get to heaven and, you know. I mean, we just, you know, we're just so earthly and carnal and in our own world and in our own life and we have no heart for the Lord and you know and uh, you know on one hand I can say I'm not condemning you but on the other hand I can say I'm condemned and I'm not condemned to hell I'm not condemned to to go and going out of here going oh my god you know now I'm so bummed out I can't do anything I'm unworthy it's not that it's that I want you Lord I want you I want you I'm gonna go after you I'm gonna rip everything out of my way to get to you put it as a token on your hands and as frontlets on your eyes get it all over where you function Make sure that you see this enough that you conform to it. And your hands carry it out in spirit and in truth. My words are not law, they're spirit and they're truth. All right, so I'm gonna, um, let me just run through the chart real quick. The top line is the categories underneath and I probably should pull this out. Get a bigger hammer, right? <laughs> All right, emphasis. Okay, so we got the emphasis of uh, the first category that we dealt with, um, and it is eating the lamb. It is eating the dead lamb. God 
that's important. God wants you to eat the dead lamb, okay? Uh, my broken body, this is my body. Broken for you, eat it. Okay? And then, so, so uh, then we have unleavened bread and then the firstborn, which we were just talking about. So <clears throat> the respect, the type of respect is that the Passover, which is the slain lamb, the Passover is the slain lamb, not the death angel passing over. You remember that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is a, it's an ordinance and it's a service to the Lord. Uh, the uh, unleavened bread is a service and a memorial. And that one threw me a little bit because I kind of like, I leaned toward the other two, but then the Lord helped me to see something. Um, and then the firstborn is, how do you show respect to this when you give your son, your firstborn son? You give Christ the firstborn son when, when death calls for it. Don't run, don't hide, don't, you know, try to be spiritual, you know. <clears throat> All right. Um, so the second category is who was this spoken to? This one was really interesting because with the Passover, it was speaking to your children. When your children ask this, then da 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 da. Um, with the unleavened bread, it is show your son. Show this unleavened bread. That's, that's important. We'll hit a little summary at the end of this, and we'll see what that means. But we're supposed to show that to people, this eating of the unleavened bread. Um, and then the firstborn is when the firstborn asks. When your firstborn son asks you, what is, what is this? You, you tell him. You tell him. God wanted his firstborn son. And you have been chosen. You are a firstborn. You're not just Israel. And we're at the Passover, we eat the lamb. You remember that? You know, you can refer to that. Because the firstborn situation, if you look at it, it's not tied to um, any. It's not like unleavened bread where, you know, on this day in this month, you got to do this. A, a child can be born and get older at a certain age or whatever, and then you can tell him at any time when you think he's ready. Um, okay, so then the, a feast, is there a feast for the Passover? Yes. Okay, is there a feast of unleavened bread? Yes. Is there a feast of the firstborn? Yes, it's the fellowship with the lamb as you go into death or allow him to bear about in your body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That's, a, that's quite the feast there. Amen. Fellowship with the lamb in it. Okay. And then uh, how? How does it happen? You observe it and you keep it, the Passover. When it comes to unleavened bread, you remember and keep it. And the firstborn, you set him apart. There's a lot of action there with the firstborn. A lot of living this reality. And then what? Okay, the, there is a Passover, which is the slain lamb. And then there is a Passover, which is the death angel going over. Okay. Uh, what in relationship to unleavened bread? You're delivered out of the house of bondage. It's better than you think. It's not... Well, I'll just say it's better than you think. Um, and then for the firstborn, the firstborn is the Lord's. That's what. <laughs> what meaneth this? I'll tell you what. <laughs> firstborn belongs to the Lord and give it to him because you got it. He, you ate it. You put it inside of you. He's there. Cough him up. <laughs> Sorry. That's old Texas way of dealing with that. Um, and then just the extra was that the unleavened bread was very much a, um, a thing to be lived and worked out of our lives and stuff. I've done these things all my life. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to give you a summary now of the three areas, first with some scriptures and then with just a little saying. Uh, you, you've heard these scriptures, so if you want to just listen, I, I'll give you the references. 
The first one is the emphasis of the Passover lamb, the slain lamb. And it's Exodus 12, 5 through 8. <clears throat> your lamb, your lamb shall be without blemish. Well, that ought to clue us right away that we're not the lamb and that we're not the firstborn. <clears throat> A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it on the, on the side posts and the upper post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. If you, I, I believe if you put blood on doorposts of a place where you didn't eat the lamb, you are dead meat. All right. Um, and verse 8, And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, which moves us to the next phase. Okay, but before I say that, let me just make this two little sentence thing. Don't try to get help from the living lamb. The Spirit of God said, pause, Randy. Let, him, let it sink in. You have a dead lamb on the inside of you. I know it sounds weird, but that was what the communion was. Commune with that lamb, that slain lamb. And he's like Abel, dead and yet he lives, right? <clears throat> um, and then eat and live by the crucified lamb inside of you. Eat and then live by the crucified lamb on the inside of you. All right. So someone say to me, well, I don't know how to live it. Okay. Eat and live by the crucified lamb inside of you. Okay. But how do I do that? Eat and live. I mean, there is no explanation except eat and live by the crucified lamb on the inside of you. If that really is true and it's that simple, then you could write that down and pray that every 30 minutes. <laughs> you know? Lord, make that real with, inside of me. I want, this is what I want, even though I don't. Is it okay to say that to him? It is. Of course it is. He already knows it. You're not hiding anything. He's not going, really? You know, like you're shocking him with, you know. All right. Phase two, or emphasis two, unleavened bread. Exodus 12, 9, and 10. Uh, and this, this is bleeding over also, and they will because they're all part of a greater whole. Eat, this is Exodus 12, verse 9 and 10, and this is in relationship to unleavened bread, although it... Uh, <coughs> uh, Uh, let's see. You know what? I think I might have put the wrong scriptures down. It'd be real easy to read the unleavened bread ones, but how about I read, um, gosh, I can't believe I didn't do that one. <clears throat> yeah, I... I think I wanted to go to the latter part of chapter 12, <clears throat> but let me just do this one. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Okay. Now, if you remember, one of the things it said, and, and we, we leave these things out, but it says, uh, and that's why I'm a little sad because I don't have the exact scripture, but you know that this is true. It says about eating the lamb, and then it says like the last one that I read, which was uh, Exodus 12, verse 8, and it said, and roast with fire and unleavened bread. And it goes on to say, if I'm not mistaken, uh, if, and if it doesn't say it there, it says it, bitter herbs, lamb, unleavened bread, bitter herbs. Anybody, raise your hand if you know that's, that's a fact. 
That's what, that's what it's, the three main things that it is. All right, <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Okay, so we go, well, I won't do anything, uh, I won't do anything bad so it doesn't leaven all my good. Well, that's not what it's saying. It's talking about unleavened bread. What does unleavened bread do? Uh, or what does leavened bread do? It rises, it puffs up, okay? Your glorying is not good. This is how it starts. And that's fixing to talk about the unleavened bread in the New Testament. Your glorying is not good. All right. Okay, so we, we will read that and we'll go, okay, my glorying is not good. No, he's going to go on and say, it's not just not good. It's leavened bread. You are defiling the feast, the true meaning of that, because we are living in the true meaning of it, and they were just a shadow. You're defiling my feast, and I, I've come to feast with you, and you're glorying in yourself. Okay? <clears throat> know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out, therefore, and I like this sentence, verse 7, purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. Now, don't be offended because he called you a lump. Because he did say you're a new one. <laughs> All right. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. And you remember, don't you? That's what he said. You go through the whole house. You go through everything. Make sure there's none of this in your house. We're the house of God. Amen? All right. So, so then he says... Um, for even Christ, our Passover, is crucified for us. Okay, so uh, what did he just describe the Passover as? Christ sacrificed. Okay, but he's saying this shouldn't be in there because Christ, the lamb, was slain and you ate that. And it's in you too. And it should override that. His nature should override that. <clears throat> All right? Paul seems more jubilant in verse 8. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay, so um, therefore let us keep the feast. So this is the true keeping of the feast. It's a memorial. It's meant to be memorial ministry. Your leaven, your unleavened, well, I mean, your leaven should bow down to the lamb and be overridden by it. <clears throat> um, malice, wickedness, whatever it's talking about here is talking about that which is in us that is not Christ, that has got to always lift itself up, that's always got to say something, you got, I got to say something, or interject yourself in some manner, or uh, there was a, a big singing star that was on uh, the memorial for um, Aretha Franklin, and they chose her to do the very last part and she had six minutes to, to do this in this memorial thing, and she said the word I 56 times. And everybody was just like, you're not, this is all about you. Aretha Franklin died, and you're, you know, declaring yourself. Well, you know, I mean, I know you're shocked, but nobody's got a time, a, 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 clock on how many times you say I or whatever or I do see I just said it I am at fault you know you can do that you can take the blame and still be glorifying yourself <clears throat> all right so um, so here's what I wrote in, in relationship to that and the bitter herbs you shall face bitter herbs in your walk to the land of promise. 
right? From, from the time they left Egypt to the time they got to the land of promise, they, they faced a lot of bitter herbs. I'm not talking about eating something. I'm talking about bad situations arising, things that can make you bitter, things that can make your stomach sour, things that, that ruffle your feathers and all this. You shall face bitter herbs in your walk to the promised land. Don't endure them. Eat them. Take them in, but not alone. Do it with roasted, with fire, lamb. Let lamb override bitterness. And also eat unleavened bread. Don't get discouraged over bitter pills, because that's where, the, where we use that. That was a bit, bitter pill. Well, it's bitter herbs, and you're still choking on it. Uh, don't get discouraged over bitter pills and don't get puffed up over your rights, what you deserve, or over your leaders. Purge out the old and become a new lump. <clears throat> that's, that's celebrating the feast. That's the true fulfillment. And Jesus is going, finally! I would say it like a Jew, but, you know, if God said it, he's not Jewish. Um, so, uh, so, so I saw two things, bitter herbs and the potential for leavened bread. One makes you mean or bad-tempered or say stuff or whatever. Uh, the other one puffs you up. Okay? So you see all of that in the wilderness. They're griping and complaining. They're griping about their leader, so they're puffed up saying, well, we know what's better, and da-da-da-da. They're griping about this. They're, doing, they're, they're uh, weeping because, you know, let us go back to Egypt and all this stuff. Almost the whole journey was them eating only bitter herbs and leavened bread. Where's the feast? Is there a feast with unleavened bread? No. Not when that's going on. There's no fellowship. There's no feast. Forget it. It's not happening. All right. Um, and then the third emphasis was the firstborn. Exodus 4.22, of course. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. All right, so, um, you know, it sounds so wicked and everything that he would, he would do that. Well, this is just revenge or whatever, but he did slay your firstborn, and that was Adam, the nature of Adam. He slayed him. And he's going, okay, now can you let my firstborn son go and come out of you and, and meet me in the wilderness? Because that's where, you know, I never got a chance to say that before, but that was always there in me when the Lord shared it, was he wants to take you into the wilderness and have it turn out completely different. Yes. Meet me in the wilderness. We will... We will sacrifice together. We will feast together. We will be like the prodigal son and his father. We will dance together. We will rejoice together. Well, it wasn't a trip like that. It was 40 years of misery until they all dropped. And then a new lump came up. <laughs> their kids, their kids decided, we'll go in. Amen. Amen. Praise God. It's great. Okay, you know, we only got a little bit of time, and I really would like to try to uh, put a nail in this coffin, <laughs> this coffin of death that Randy always shares. <sighs> oh, wretched man that he is. Okay, I want to just give you some quick things on uh, the firstborn in relationship to... Uh, terms that have meaning in in this whole thing and here's why we are about to get into actual life situations in the book of genesis and there are a lot of reactions and you need to know why the reactions are going on because it doesn't always just spell it out it lets you know that's the issue but it doesn't spell out all their motives 
you have to see their reaction and then you have to realize what's, what is the real issues and then one and one is two. <clears throat> All right, so um, uh, the term firstborn has uh, two meanings and actually I wrote a bunch of stuff here. So the, it's uh, the first son to be born, um, but God, just so you know, and I'll probably say that here, uh, with God, um, it's not about birth order. It's what spirit he finds. And I will tell you with that little bit, this will explain Romans 9. Yeah. This will explain all the stuff that seems so unexplainable in that chapter. <clears throat> all right. Um, firstborn means not only in priority of time, and that, that, will, that will apply as we get more into Jesus in this thing. Um, uh, he, he, the firstborn is the one who gains the rights and authority of that firstborn. Uh, the firstborn's privileges and responsibility are known as his birthright. Um, so what was the big issue between Jacob and Esau? birthright. Did you, anybody see how big this stuff is? My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. It takes over the whole Bible. It's like 11. <laughs> but it's not. Okay. Um, the firstborn are set apart, consecrated, and they belong to God. Uh, some of the benefits, um, the, the firstborn possessed definite privileges which were denied to other members of the family. Okay. All right. Firstborn possessed definite privileges which were denied to other members of the family. All right. So we go, see, they're special. Yeah. The greatest responsibility they have, though, is to, is to um, die, is to be sacrificed. And that is the, their call. Every firstborn is God's, and that's what they're called to do. So... You know, you, you say, well, you know, they got all these privileges and stuff. And, you know, well, if you are you willing to die? Come, jump right in the bandwagon, you know. But if you're not, don't gripe about somebody else being blessed in certain areas when they know where they're heading. To the cross, to death, to rejection, to people not understanding, to things being unfair, to da-da-da-da big deal None, that's the wilderness and you can turn it into a feast by being with the Lord if you if you have his spirit and you have the firstborn if if lamb is coursing through your veins amen come on that's not bad news <clears throat> um, the firstborn son normally received a double portion of the inheritance he inherited his father's role as head of the family, and that's going to be a big one. Both of those will be. He's, he's given the honor and submission from other, what I put is, uh, I didn't have enough room on my iPad, so I put, uh, he's given the honor and submission from other bros and sterns, cisterns. Bros and sterns, brothers and sisters. Given God, he's given God's blessing of care, protection, provision, guidance. That's just look at the promise to Abraham. Just read it close, and you'll see God is going to be with this man in in role of caring for him, in the role of blessing him, in the role of protecting, in the role of provision, in the role of guidance. Why? Because he's mine. And we'll get into that eventually, but you will see that Abraham went through all kind of junk constantly, constantly, to see if he was going to truly be a firstborn. Um, and then the firstborn is the favored son of the father. It denotes his status before God, family, and those whom God gives it is not just about his birth order. Uh, 
All right. So I think our timing is good. Um, uh, we will get into Cain and Abel next time. So it might be good to read over that. You already have, you already have all the information you need. And if you take this and you don't treat it like a lesson, you treat it like holy ground that God wants to open the Bible with and lay it over that, you'll go, oh my goodness, the father wants his firstborn son. And when we think we're firstborn without that son, we are an abomination to God. And we will do things that are so contrary to the spirit of the lamb. We'll say things that are so contrary to the spirit of the land. We'll have attitudes that are so contrary to the spirit of the land. Father, you put your lamb in us when we were born again, just like Israel when they ate the Passover. They might have thought it was a ritual. They probably ate lamb a million times before that. That probably was not their first time to ever eat lamb. But in your eyes, this was the greatest moment that they could have was you are imparting your firstborn son into them so that way they can walk out of Egypt and they cannot walk into the promised land. You didn't do that. You marched them straight into the wilderness with all the trials, the hunger, the thirst, the things. And you said, come, come, come out here and join and feast with me and celebrate with me and sacrifice with me and serve me in this way. And Father, I just... I just thank you that that was all just a shadow, all of it, and all, all the way through the Bible up until us was a shadow, and you've actually put the real lamb in us when we got saved. And we maybe, just like Israel, thought we just got saved, and we just really have no clue about bringing that lamb to, to stream through our being so that he affects our mind and motives and attitudes. There is hope for us because he's in us. Christ in us is the hope of glory. You put him there. And you want, you want us to, to uh, eat him in such a manner that he can override the bitter herbs of the things that come our way that he can override the, the pride and the things that want to push themselves forward or be seen or be important or be respected or whatever the, the, the term is, that, that that lamb will come out of us unto you. We will let him go. We won't hold him back anymore. We won't hold him back anymore. We'll let him go, and he'll go straight to the altar to you, Father. Go head straight to you and straight to the altar because that's who he is and that's the way he operates. Father, we have carnal minds and we don't understand all this, so we worry and we fret and we look at that and say, well, if I do that, then this is... We have so many carnal thoughts that, that are not even valid in this world, in this realm of what you're talking about. It's another world. It's another mind. It's a, it is freeing. It is not bondage. You delivered us from bondage. And we ask you to, to, again, breathe. Don't teach us, Holy Spirit. Breathe, just like Jesus breathed on the 12 disciples and said, receive this Holy Spirit, the breath of God in you, and let him flow in you as the breath of God, not just a teacher or not just as somebody that makes us feel good during a worship service. We need lamb flowing through our veins and we need breath of God flowing through our heart and our minds to be able to have our eyes open and our heart open to more lamb. That we could lengthen our ropes and our stakes, make more room in this tent, this, this house, this temple more room for the lamb, more room. So, Father, we just pray that you can break us from our 
are religious carnal ways that, that defeat you on every turn, that literally hold you back. And being a lamb, you won't push your way. So, so we defeat you, Lamb of God. We war against you like in the book of Revelation. We war against you. We make war with you. We are the enemy. We are your enemy. But we do have the lamb in us. And we do have the breath of the spirit in us. And we say, make a turn. To help us to, 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 to purge out the old leaven and become a new lump so that you can mold us exactly the way you want us. Thank you, Lord. Maybe, maybe right now it's just baby steps. Maybe it's one step at a time. But Lord, don't let us, if, even if we are experiencing baby steps, don't let us just stay there and never gaining stride with you like Enoch did. He walked with you. He didn't have you slow down to walk with him. Enoch walked with God. And then he wasn't. He was taken. Hallelujah. I want to be taken up into you. I'm not talking about heaven. I mean up into you because I've spent so much time walking and hearing you. Lord, and help us that when we are with you, not to talk so much. Help us to listen. We, 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 we pray so much and we do so little listening and when i say we pray so much when we pray even if it's not very much at all it's talking about us it's talking about our life down here help us to listen to come to you and say i don't want to say anything what do you want to say and if you don't want to say anything i will be happy just to be with you i will be happy to just be with you and feel your presence and love you. Father, move by your spirit, by your breath upon us and within us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.